Okay, so let's get started. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to today's session of the Zebra Inflation Drivers and Dynamics webinar. My name is Rafael Schöne, and I'm one of the organizers of this webinar series on behalf of the Central Bank Research Association with the Center for Inflation Research at the Cleveland Fed. And Dominic Smith is my uh, other co-organizer. Without much ado, let me pass on the virtual stage to Matt Klippert from the um, Federal Reserve, uh, uh, who will be today's moderator. Matt, uh, the floor is yours. All right, thank you, Raphael. Um, so the topics of today's sessions are memory and beliefs, evidence from the field, and multilateral co-movement in a new Keynesian world. A little trade goes a long way. Uh, so special thanks to the organizers, Raphael and Dominic. Um, as for the format of this webinar, the webinar will be 45 minutes in length uh, in total with two presentations of approximately 15 minutes each, and then 10 to 15 minutes for a Q&A at the end. Uh, attendees do not have the option to switch on your audio and video, but you are invited to write comments or questions in the Q&A space. Uh, att attendees can, of course, post their questions during the presentations, or you can wait uh, until the end if you desire. Uh, I will then select questions to be answered in the Q&A portion of the webinar after the presentations have finished. Uh, also, this webinar is being live streamed via the SEBRA YouTube channel, recorded and made available on the SEBRA website uh, and the SEBRA YouTube channel after this event. Uh, and then the standard disclaimer, uh, participation in a SEBRA webinar does not constitute or imply an endorsement, recommendation, or favoring endorsement of the views, opinions, products, or services of the Central Bank Research Association or any participating institution, individual or entity. Uh, all views expressed during this event uh, are strictly those of the authors, discussants, and other participations, participants, and not those of SEBRA, the co-sponsor institutions, or any participating institution. Uh, so without further ado, let me introduce the speakers. So we have Michael Weber, Associate Professor at Chicago Booth, presenting Memory and Beliefs, Evidence from the Field, uh, and Felipe Schwartzman, Senior Economist at the Federal Reserve Bank of Richmond, presenting Multilateral Co-Movement in a New Keynesian World, A Little Trade Goes a Long Way. Uh, so I will give the floor over to Michael. You're on mute, Michael. Yeah, perfect. So like, uh, thanks a lot, uh, Matt, for the introduction and uh, for like the uh, kind of opportunity to present this work. This is joint work with Francesco da Cunto. Like, you know, the, my disclaimer is that what I'm saying today is representing my view of what we are doing. And hopefully it is positively correlated with how Francesco sees this project. And so like, you know, what we try to do here is to shed a little bit more light at the micro mechanisms through which people form expectations just to motivate like our specific kind of view on that. Let me actually touch base on some of the things we've been doing over the last few years. So like, you know, we started out like trying to understand, and this is like has been first documented by Jonung in Sweden in 82, why women have lot higher inflation expectations than men. This comes from the New York Fed SCE between 2013 and 2019, when we realized inflation was below 2% on average. Like you see, everyone had upward biased expectations, but somehow it appears that women had even higher inflation expectations than men. Now, of course, there are maybe important differences between men and women. It's unclear, however, why inflation expectations should be part of that. Now, what we then actually found in like our own one wave survey in June of 2016, that in fact, you know, it has nothing to do with gender per se, but rather potentially with like, you know, traditional gender norm that are still prevalent also in the US. So like what we did here, like we asked the male and female household head within the same survey, you know, what do you think will be inflation over the next 12 months? What I'm plotting here in the left panel within household differences. So therefore, like, you know, I'm able to keep constant lots of things that might vary and uh, plug the previous picture, like, you know, kind of uh, family size, number of kids, income, occupation, and so on. And within household, you also see that on average, women have about a 0.4 higher inflation expectations relative to men. But then actually what you see is like, you know, if you split just simply the sample of households into those households where based on the separate survey question, the male household head declares that, you know, I'm never going grocery shopping. That's this middle panel here. 
Whereas, you know, here the male household had declared, you know, once in a while I go grocery shopping. You see that this whole gender difference in inflation expectations is driven by households that have a t traditional allocation of uh, duties within households. Like when the male household had never does the grocery shopping, the gap is higher. Instead, actually, in households in which the female, uh, the male household had also at least once in a while to go shopping, this gap closes to zero because in those households, the male household had also has higher expectations. And then actually, you know, can of course just ask people like, you know, what type of signals would you typically use to form inflation expectations? And what you actually find is like, you know, at least within our panel, the predominant source that people actually refer to as the most important source to form inflation expectations is actually their own shopping experience. Like, you know, official news sources, TV, newspaper, certainly important, but way less important than what people see when they walk down the aisle in their supermarket. And actually, then we try to understand this, whether it's indeed the case that kind of like the realized inflation within the grocery domain, people at the household level experience matters for like differences in overall one year ahead CPI inflation. And so what we did on the Nielsen Homescan panel, we kind of follow the BLS with two little twists. We define household specific consumption bundles and household specific prices paid. And that in fact, actually both of these angles make actually a difference. And then what we show is that, you know, if you are living in a household that over the last 12 months had the lowest realized inflation in your own bundle, you have actually a, a substantially lower one year ahead overall CPI inflation relative to a household that had the highest realized inflation. Now you could say, well, maybe they're just forecasting their own bundle inflation. If they do that, they're really bad forecasters because the realized inflation in their own bundle is pretty much flat and cannot be predicted by past realized inflation in their own bundle. What you don't see here, two twists to this figure, this association actually becomes stronger if you actually weigh goods based on the frequency with which they purchase them rather than expenditure shares. So what we call a frequency CPI is way more important. And crucially also, like you know, people tend to put more weight on price increases relative to equal size cuts. So like, let me now tell you a little bit more in detail the data we used for like the remaining 10 minutes in the today's talk. So we use this Nielsen Homescan panel and it's also been extensively used in some work with Corbio and Gordon Echenko. So like, you know, here what we are doing kind of, you know, we run our own customized surveys on this Nielsen panel to elicit inflation expectations, lots of other interesting stuff. And the key nice uh, innovation of the running surveys on this panel is that you can actually directly observe what people purchase, what they pay, whether they use coupons, where they go shopping and so on. So like a really rich set of signals people witness when they go shopping. So here's just some ideas. Like, you know, here we have 6,000 people in the survey, common like uh, as a representative of shopping duties within household, more than two thirds uh, is female, slightly uh, higher than average age, you know, higher than average income, more than average uh, college education. Crucially for today, in January of 2022, the average expectations for one year had inflation and measured by a point estimate was 11.5%. And people perceived that their milk price on average had gone up by about 19% over the previous 12 months. Tell you in a second why we think inflation of milk is important. And then, you know, trip to trip, you know, of course, like, you know, the price of milk stays constant most of the time, sometimes goes up a bit, then it goes down a bit. And then some once in a while you have like, you know, changes in reference prices. I'll also do a split when I look at people that always go shopping in the same outlet of the same chain. That's about 16% of our sample. The others go shopping across outlets or actually across chains. So now what I actually kind of want to bring to the data is kind of some insights from like uh, cognitive psychology literature that argues kind of when we actually, you know, go around, we observe, observe lots of signals. And then we store these signals in our memory database, but actually different from like, you know, let's say my laptop, you know, I cannot recall all the signals perfectly. And then like, you know, once in a while, you know, when I form expectations, I try to uh, kind of draw signals from my memory database, but actually like, you know, this recall is actually not perfect, but it's selective. Only certain uh, signals will be uh, kind of retrieved. And, you know, the signals that are retrieved ultimately are more likely to be retrieved if it's due to like, a salient signal and always observed in a certain context. And then, you know, potentially like, you know, if other stuff is kind of interfering with my retrieval process, that potentially can drive out the role of like the salient and frequently observed signals. So that's kind of like, you know, I tell you in a bit more detail how we do that, but that's kind of the framework 
And then actually, we also want to directly see whether the recall signals matter for overall beliefs. Let me just now sketch like the way we think then this memory database might look like. You know, I live on top of a supermarket. When I go down, you know, I see all the different prices. You know, uh, kind of most of the time there's a zero price change. Sometimes a temporary price cut that then is reversed. And then actually from goods I purchase frequently. You know, I have many many entries. You know, when I get tenure, I might actually finally want to celebrate. I get buy a Wagyu steak, but of course I only get tenure once, and so therefore from these type of goods. I have fewer entries. That's the first thing we want to test. So like, you know, you have most of the time small entries and then however, certain goods are more frequently purchased, more likely to be retrieved. And then what are potentially these type of goods? Of course, you can just ask people. In 2016, we asked people, you know, when you answered our inflation expectations question, were there any specific goods that came to mind? In the US, you see like, you know, milk really important, more so for women than for men. Like if you were in Germany, it would be the price of beer. In Italy, it's the price of the espresso, though there's heterogeneity both across countries, but also across gender. The second thing we want to look briefly at is like, you know, the frequency with which people go shopping. If I go shopping down all the time, you know, I live on top of the supermarket. When I need milk, I just go down most of the time, same price. Once in a while, price cut that is quickly reversed, you know, kind of, kind of unlikely that I see oftentimes like a change in reference prices. Instead, actually, like, you know, if I'm an infrequent shopper, I live in the suburbs and go then downtown once in a while. Yeah, I gave way fewer entries. I'm more likely to observe price increases, relatively speaking. And I'm more likely that one of the price changes I see is due to a change in reference prices. So the average absolute price change should be larger. So I now actually want to show you here how often do people purchase milk? Lots of uh, heterogeneity across these 6,000 households over the course of a year. Median frequency once a week. But some people like I, you know, they go shopping for milk all the time. Now, what I want to show you is that, you know, if you go shopping for milk uh, more frequently, the number of times you just don't see any price change is increasing, indeed consistent with our intuition. Then actually, like the less frequently you go shopping, the larger is the average absolute change in the milk price. That's actual data from shopping trip by shopping trip data at the household level, consistent again. And then what you also see is the fraction of price increases relative to cuts is also larger. So now what I want to show you that is indeed matters for how people think about price changes of milk. So bottom line, smaller price, a smaller database means a larger price changes would lead to a larger recalled milk price change. That's also, of course, something we can test. So we asked them in January of last year, think about the milk you typically purchase in the volume you typically purchase it in the store you typically purchase it. What do you think is the milk price today? And what do you think was the milk price a year ago? And so then we can show if I have a small memory database, which we measure by going shopping less than once a week, Indeed, I perceive a larger change in milk prices. And just here to make a kind of as a plausibility check, women are more likely to go shopping and rely on milk. They have a stronger association. Second thing we want to test, is it the case that larger and more salient price changes are easier to be recalled? And is it the case that they kind of IQ like a different context? This might drive out my recall process. So let me see, like, you know, first thing is like, you know, a salience, like if I have a larger price change, there's a larger association with a perceived uh, milk price change. And here, omitted category is like the first quantile. So relative to the first quantile, if you had a large change in milk prices, indeed, you perceive a stronger one. Then like context dependence, here, this is like the small subset of our panel, always going to the same supermarket, always going down the same aisle, always go shopping and grabbing the milk in the same uh, part of the store very stronger association relative to the complementary sample. The last thing then I want to show you is actually like, you know, first of all, that indeed the perceived milk price change matters for people to think about overall inflation. So here, XX, let's just ask them, what do you think is the milk price today? What do you think was the milk price 12 months ago? We calculate the percentage change. Y axis, we previously asked them in the same survey a couple of questions earlier. What do you think will be overall CPI inflation over the next 12 months? And you do see that it's a pretty strong correlation between the two. So indeed, people seem to actually focus on single goods when they think actually what will happen to overall inflation. And so this is not just in a regression format. Here we see the correlation. As we saw, slope is definitely substantially less than one. Now what we want to do in terms of like uh, potentially seeing like, you know, 
uh, how this recall process might also help us to uh, explain an upward bias. The first thing actually we want to do is to test for proactive interference. You know, I think about the price change of milk over the last 12 months, but I didn't purchase buying milk only 12 months ago. With a certain probability, I might actually kind of uh, draw a signal from two years, three years, four years ago. And of course, due to trend inflation, with a certain probability, I draw a lower price relative to what the price 12 months ago was. So is it then the case that people kind of underestimate what the price of milk was 12 months ago? And that's actually what you see in the data relative to what they actually paid that we observe in the Nielsen home scan data. You know, there's a fat left tail, meaning that people recall a price that was lower relative to the, what they actually paid. Good part is like, actually there's a big mass at zero, like, you know, it's meaningful what we measure in the data. And of course, this on the flip side means if I underestimate the past price and we see in the data you are correct about the current price, you should overestimate the change in uh, milk price inflation. That's actually indeed a fat right tail this time. You perceive a higher inflation for milk. Now putting those pieces together, those that actually underestimate the price of milk 12 months ago, overestimate the change in milk prices and then also overestimate overall inflation. Let me just wrap up with the last thing. And this is the only thing where I can claim causality. You know, to the best of your knowledge, is there a gas station on your way to work? 50% of our sample were asked. And then we just want to see whether now queuing a context for inflation that is different from milk drives out the association between inflation and milk. And you see that if you introduce an interaction term between recalled milk prices and just a dummy asks an additional question at the beginning that drives out potentially or interferes with my recollection process, it's indeed the case that, you know, the interference also matters. And so like, let me wrap up here. So like, you know, I think uh, in this ongoing work, we just want to set a little bit of more detailed light on how people form inflation expectations at the micro level. Thank you. Hi, can you hear me? Okay, good. Yeah. Uh, thank you, you know, for having our paper here. This is trying to work with Paul and Pierre. They're also here watching. You know, we work for the Federal Reserve Bank of Richmond, but these are not the views of the Federal Reserve Bank of Richmond. Usual disclaimer applies. But the paper has, you know, been motivated, I think, you know, from policy questions. Um, one kind of motivation is, you know, you see a war in Europe, you know, how how, how does that impact? U.S. inflation, right? Or, you know, you can imagine, be imagining like you're sitting in Europe now and, you know, there was this huge increase in interest rates in the U.S. How does that affect um, output in, the, in in Europe, right? And, and inflation in Europe. So we want to kind of understand these things. Of course, it is well known that there's a lot of co-movement in, you know, output and inflation across countries. So here are like four major economies plus Canada, which is a major trading partner for the U.S. Um, one thing which is a little bit less well known is that there's also some kind of interesting cross correlations between inflation and output. So if you think about a reduced form Phillips curve correlation between output growth and inflation, you know, in the US, you also have like a global, you know, reduced form Phillips curve correlation between output in the US and inflation in Canada, say. So this is like the bars here in the bottom. Um, so I want to understand, OK, what is explaining these fluctuations um, and this co-movement? One star is global shocks. You know, COVID affected everyone. Another is spillovers and, you know, through trade or, you know, or, or trade in goods or in assets. Our focus here, our main focus here today is going to be, you know, propagation through trade. So propagation through trade, you know, hasn't been like a, a huge focus. And, and I think part of that is trade shares are small relative to countries' output. So if you look at the U.S. economy, about 80% of what the U.S. Produced, produces is used internally. And eight percent of what you know U.S. residents use is produced internally. So, and 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 you know numbers are lower for China or Europe, but it's 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 still the majority. Then again, you know we do have empirical work that finds that foreign variables matter for inflation. So we want to think about these things together. And what we do is we have a framework, a structural framework that is very tractable, and that combines nominal rigidities and trade of goods and assets across multiple countries. And essentially, what this does is 
you know, you're going to have the three equations from the new, new Keynesian model, you know, for each country, but also have another four sets of equations for each country with, you know, the trade linkages and, you know, asset flows and all of these things. The main takeaway is that quantitatively important trade spillovers uh, uh, exist and they're due to indirect effects that propagate through the trade network. So let me give a little bit of intuition how this works. Um, say you have some country foreign one and consumption goes up in that country. You know, that country is going to consume more, it's going to produce more, output and employment goes up, wages go up, and it starts importing more from other countries, foreign two and three. Those countries are going to produce more, their output is going to go up, their wages are going to go up, and they're going to start importing more from home. Wages in, at home go up, and that makes home want to import more from foreign one. And then the cycle, you know, repeats itself. And of course, you know, in real life, you have arrows going in all sorts of directions. And the key here is you have a lot of arrows, right? Okay, let me show you a little bit more about the model. So the way we model this is we have a handful of countries, I think like five in, in a quantitative application. And uh, each of these countries has, you know, a layer of workers and then two layers of intermediate goods producers. So there's a first layer, um, they produce tradable goods and these get traded across countries. Um, and it's it's like an Eaton Horton model. Um, and then those tradable goods are purchased by a second layer of intermediate goods producers that assemble them and uh, resell them, you know, uh, in, 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 they have monopolistic power, they have sticky prices, it's kind of like causal firms. Um, and they produce like a final good, which is consumed internally and it's, it's used as consumption. And in a model, we have portfolio costs, to be able to think about financial frictions. I'm not gonna focus on this today. Um, and what this gives us is kind of a vectorized system of log linear equations, right? So here, think about the three equation model, right? The, these equations are here or some variant of them, uh, but these are vectors now. So consumption is a vector, interest rate is a vector, inflation is a vector, right? And, and for those three equations here, they collapse, you know, if you close off trade, they're going to collapse to, to the ones that we're familiar with. Um, and, and they're kind of a diagonal system, right? So the, the, all the, all the, all the interactions across countries are going to take place in the other four equations, and they're going to, you know, take place through marginal costs. So here I wrote Phillips curve as a function of marginal costs, not output, because marginal costs here are not going to be proportional to output. Um, so how are marginal costs determined? You know, if I had a closed economy, marginal costs would just be wages. Because the economy is open, marginal cost is some weighted average of wages across different countries. The weights are given by import shares. So you have these kind of backward linkages kind of playing a role here. Um, of course, you know, you need to bring everything to the same unit. So this is why you also have exchange rates here. Now, closed economy wages are proportional to output. Here they're not because, you know, output and, and, and consumption are different because we have trade balances. So we need to keep track of that. Um, and then we have a set of equations for the trade balance. So those equations look like this and they have two components. One part is just relative demand in export markets. So consumption in the US goes up. China is going to export to the US and output in China is going to go up and trade balance in the US, China is going to go up in proportion to how much China exports to the US. So this Psi matrix here is a matrix of export shares and it's picking up these forward linkages, right? Um, then we have relative price changes. So if wages in the US go up, you know, the US is going to import, you know, China is going to be able to export more to the US right? Um, and, and it's going to do that more if the price elasticity, uh, uh, the trade elasticity is higher, right? So this is what the price elasticity one plus bar phi is doing. Um, but also, because wages in the US are higher, China can export more to Canada, because Canada buys from the US, and now China is going to divert its trade from the US to China. So this is the kind of like second order, you know, or sometimes people call these third country effects that the model allows for explicitly. And this is why in this relative price component here, you see both the export matrix, you know, whatever happens in the US matters to China to the extent that China exports to the US. And you have the import matrix, whatever happens to the US matters for Canada to the extent that Canada imports from the US. So both backward and forward linkages are here. Um, you know, we need to determine exchange rates. We have equations for financial asset allocations. Um, the black part is what you get under complete markets. This is the back to Smith condition. And, um, you know, there's just consumption for moves, except if you have relative price uh, differences given by the exchange rate, that's going to be a poor fit for exchange rate. So we have these extra components 
that have to do with financial frictions. One is endogenous and depends on financial flows. The other is exogenous and it just depends on, on shocks. Um, and then finally, we have a set of balance of payments equations that tells us what financial flows are. Financial flows are going to be a function of trade balance. So this kind of connects everything. And this is the model in a nutshell, a bunch of vector equations that are kind of easy to interpret and look through. So, um, so what do we, can we do with that? One thing that we can do, and this is just from like the Phillips curve, you know, wage equation and, you know, marginal costs, how they're determined. So nothing about financial uh, flows or, or details of trade flows. You can get a global Phillips curve and that tells you already something about spillovers, right? So output goes up in a country, consumption goes up in the country. That's going to affect inflation in other countries through the backward linkages. Um, now, you know, we're not going to try to estimate this directly. Everything is endogenous. So we're going to do some Bayesian estimation. Before that, I want to tell you a little bit about, you know, cross country movement, which is really what we're after. And, um, you know, what we're going to do here is develop a very special case, right? And the special case here has a forward looking Taylor rule where interest rates depend on forward, you know, expected inflation and where everything is ID, right? So this is kind of a nice, uh, uh, you know, sandbox to play with because everything is ID here. So you can solve everything with pencil and paper. Um, and in particular, consumption is ID. So we're starting from a world where, you know, you have consumption shocks. These are coming from monetary policy shocks. And these are completely ID across countries, right? And then we want to know, okay, given that, you know, starting point, how much co-movement do you get in output and inflation? Um, and, uh, you know, we have a proposition that tells us that we're going to get potentially quite a bit of co-movement. And it depends on this AYY inverse matrix, right? Which kind of has the flavor of a Leontief inverse. I'm going to tell you a little bit more about that in the next slide. Uh, but, you know, this matrix is kind of a pretty full matrix, so you get like a lot of co-movement out of that. Um, and also you're going to get co-movement in inflation because not just because of the backward linkages, but because if you have co-movement in output, then you get co-movement in inflation, right? Just through like the global Phillips curve. So how does this ALL matrix look or this Leontief inverse? You know, so nu is the monetary shock that makes consumption move around, right? Um, that affects output directly you know, consumption in the US, China reduces more just because it's exporting to the US. So it's mediated by the export matrix Psi. And then you have the indirect effects, right? And, and, and these have to do with those changes in relative prices that kind of, you know, are bouncing around, right? So you change output, you change wages and you change trade patterns and, you know, this kind of feeds on itself. And then you get multiple rounds of this. Um, those multiple rounds, how much they accumulate depend on this B parameter or, you know, Function of parameters. Uh, and what you can see there is that, you know, if trade is very elastic, um, then, you know, trade patterns react a lot to changes in relative prices. And if labor is very inelastic, wages react a lot uh, to changes, you know, to changes in output. So these two things are going to give you more movement. Um, we can use that to think about other shocks. Um, so in this model, again, we have IID TFP growth shock, so it's all like levels. The model is all written in terms of like detrended variables. So all they do is like they change, you know, a TFP shock is going to change the output and consumption in the country where it happened, but there are no spillovers. It all gets absorbed in exchange rates. Um, and then markup shocks are going to affect inflation. And in this very simple model, they don't do anything else. So it's just like an additional source of variation in inflation here. Okay, then we estimate the model. We do Bayesian estimation. You know, the key thing here is that for the shocks, they're going to have a global component and a country specific component. Um, and, uh, you know, with the estimated model, we can then ask what tries to correlations, right? And we can do counterfactuals. So, one thing we find is if we shut down trade, um, then correlations go down by about a half. Um, but if we shut down the global factors, there's an effect on, on, on inflation correlations, which is kind of close to half, but the effect on GDP correlations is very small. It's about 10%. Uh, so trade is really kind of driving a lot here. We can also use the model to think about propagation channels. So, you know, these indirect effects, we can shut them down by making trade elasticity smalls. Those seem to matter a lot. And then if we make prices very flexible and, and, and approach financial autarky, um, that's also going to make the co-movement, you know, much less prevalent. Okay, and then just to finalize, um, you know, we can look at impulse response functions. 
uh, and go back to some of these policy questions, right? So if you have an inflationary shock in Europe, say, you know, there's a war and then increased markups in Europe, what does that do to, to inflation and output uh, in the US? And, and, and it, it does quite a bit. So we get like about 20% of the increase in inflation in, the, in Europe. You know, the US gets about 20%, a fifth of the initial increase of inflation in Europe. So if you do a bit of a back of the envelope calculation, you get about like a half percentage point increase. Uh, in the US over that period, you know, from 21Q4 to 22Q1. Um, you know, if you shut down the direct effects, a lot of that goes away. Finally, you know, we can look at monetary policy shocks in the US. Those do a lot. They generate a lot of movement in output uh, across countries, uh, quite a bit of movement in inflation. So I'm just going to conclude. You know, we develop this framework, we incorporate multilateral trade and nominal rigidities, these things plus network effects seem to kind of do quite a bit in terms of generating spillovers. Uh, the model implies a global Phillips curve. Um, and, uh, you know, we can do Bayesian estimation just to kind of put numbers to what we're doing and, you know, be a little bit more disciplined from a quantitative standpoint. Thank you. Thank you, Felipe. Uh, thank you, Michael. Uh, so as a reminder to the attendees, if you have a question, please just write it in the Q&A. Uh, and then I will ask uh, the two uh, presenters. Uh, so the first question we have is from Michael. Uh, and the question is on the survey, was overall inflation always asked after milk change uh, in price question? Yeah, that's an excellent uh, question. So like the, the way we designed the service that we elicit overall inflation expectations first, and actually the way we did that is that we first actually say, you know, in the next couple of questions, we wanna get your opinion about a concept called inflation. Inflation, as you might know, is the increase in the overall level of prices and is commonly measured by the consumer price index, just also to make sure there's no ambiguity in case people are aware that there are different indices, what they should have in mind. Most people actually don't. But anyway, so like, and then after a couple of more questions, then we ask them, now we want you to think about the milk you typically purchase and so on. What do you think is the current price now? And what do you think was the price 12 months ago? And we did that on purpose to ensure like, you know, there's no mechanical anchoring effect or like, you know, what some people sometimes call Server demand effects, and so like you know, I can elaborate more on that. But then you know, we did, uh, had the opposite order. Thank you. Uh, I guess I will ask a question to to Felipe. Uh, and and my question is: so you don't have like oil in the model, but suppose that we had a global oil price shock. Would your model, because of these trade linkages, then imply some amplification effects? You know, you know creating a larger drop in global GDP through trade? Yeah, I mean, this is an excellent question. One thing we haven't done is to, to have trade in, I mean, the trade are all in intermediate inputs, right? But you, you could imagine some kind of more roundabout kind of like supply chain kind of things. And, and, and I think these would propagate the oil shocks in a way that, that, that you're thinking about. Um, so this, this is certainly like an extension that, that you know, is, is, is something that is plausible. Um, now, yeah, I would have to kind of start thinking about the model on the fly here and what the oil shocks would do and how they would like, and I would rather not do this, but my, 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 you know, my gut would tell me that, yeah, whatever mechanisms we see here would also kind of apply there. Um, so I see Rafael has a, a question as well. Yeah, uh, so I'll ask another question to Felipe from okay. this is from Rafael Shanley. Uh, so what is the role of wage rigidities and possible heterogeneity in it for the propagation of shocks? Um, for example, Europe may be very different from the US. Also, do you find a role for heterogeneity in the persistence of shocks? So we don't have wage rigidity in a model directly in terms of nominal rigidity, right? But what we do have is the trade elasticity, sorry, the supply, labor supply elasticity. And, you know, I think it is true that in the model, wages are going to react more if labor supply is less elastic. And then I guess wage, wage rigidity may count against that, right? So I think this is something definitely to think about. Um, I think heterogeneity is a fascinating question. Um, so I guess you're thinking about heterogeneity across countries. Um, yeah, I mean, again, I would rather not speculate too much about this. I mean, we do know from price setting models um, that heterogeneity can be interesting and important in like non-trivial ways, right? Uh, you know, and I guess always the question is, 
is is the aggregate response going to look more like what you get from like the least flexible sector or the or in our case country or the most like, flexible one right i mean is, is it going to bias in one of these directions i don't think i have a clear intuition about that but i think it's it's a very good question i mean absolutely something we're thinking about um heterogeneity in the persistence of the shocks across countries um you know, I think like in, in our analytics, you know, we start with IID, right? So we're not really kind of thinking too much about the persistence. Um, and, and, and the model is kind of very, very, you know, whatever persistence you have in the model is kind of inherited, you know, mm -hmm. to some extent from, from the persistence in the shocks. Um, yeah, uh, I, think, I think these are very good questions. I mean, uh, I wish I had a very good answer. Uh, thank you, Felipe. Um, so a question from Michael, from uh, an attendee. Uh, so the surveys usually made by central banks are uh, given to firms uh, rather than households because households have a small influence on inflation expectations. Uh, do you think that this study can be relevant in a macroeconomic way? No, the excellent question. So like, you know, maybe I first start out by slightly disagreeing. So my view is that actually in most surveys and actually on households when it comes to inflation expectations rather than firms like you know so the the Cleveland Fed is actually has now some uh, kind of great work also the Atlanta Fed but like you know if you look at uh, globally like if there's any survey evidence typically it's on households no no there are good reasons for that because ultimately you know like for the US two-thirds of GDP is consumption and to the extent as we now have evidence that actually inflation expectations of households by the oil equation do matter for people's uh, consumption savings decisions. Like we should actually also as a central bank in the aggregate care about people's household expectations, even though they might at first uh, glance look kind of wild dispersed. But you know, by now we do have kind of a good understanding you know, how people potentially form expectations, which of course is very different from like you know how maybe we think about it for, through the lens of traditional models. And then of course, like you know, another angle by central bankers in particular might actually uh, care a lot about kind of you know, households inflation expectations to the extent that, you know, they deviate substantially from like, you know, officially communicated targets and household, households think that actually what the central bank is doing is kind of very different from what they perceive. You know, you at some point might enter a trust crisis and it's of course in a slippery slope when central banks start losing trust and their credibility. They are way more prone to like potentially populist attacks. Think about like our previous president or globally, you know, this certainly is not uh, totally far-fetched. And so, like, you know, I think that potentially is on another concern we, we might keep in mind. Thank you. Uh, so another question for you, Michael. Uh, can you mm -hmm. measure the size of the shopping memory database in, uh, in terms of the number of goods bought on average rather than how often you go? Yeah, that's a, a great point. So, like, you know, we, that's definitely something we are currently looking into because now, we do indeed see like at the individual shopping trip level how many different UPCs or how many different goods have you purchased and so like you know at the first cut we focused on milk because like they, uh, our uh, panelists had mentioned in a different survey that milk was really important for their formation of inflation expectations but it's definitely would also be interesting whether the role of perceived milk price changes of inflation expectations is kind of modulated by how many other prices they observe within the same shopping trips. So like, you know, if I see tons of stuff, maybe I have less kind of uh, memory database capacity to really zoom into uh, the specific price of milk. I, I have to look into that. We have, that's definitely an interesting thought and we can definitely do it. Uh, and, and so one, one more question for you, Michael, before uh, I go to Felipe. Um, have you looked at true seasonal shopping, uh, such as you know buying turkey for Thanksgiving or Easter eggs for Easter, and does this give similar effects? That's actually an interesting thought. So, like you know, our survey is typically at the quarterly frequency. So, like to some extent, we could capture that. But so, like ideally, like you know, somewhat you know, kind of following up the peer pioneering work of like you know the Cleveland uh, Fed daily inflation tracker. If one could do something along those lines, you know, elicit at very higher frequency, but then also potentially match to actually shopping behavior, and then potentially indeed see that you know you see spikes in the data that you know if you talk to a traditional macroeconomist, they would say, well, it's just some measurement error or noise, but actually that you can indeed kind of make sense of that even by 
kind of uh, temporary things that we would think actually doesn't matter in the aggregate, that would actually be quite quite interesting. And, and I agree on that. All right, thank you. Uh, so a question for Felipe. Uh, so what do you think about the Hank model uh, and would it be relevant to take into account this heterogeneity across countries, uh, yeah. though probably computationally infeasible? Yeah, so I, I feel like in, in a sense, you know, we're, the model is kind of very simple and it's, you know, this has good things, right? It allows for some interesting analytics. Uh, you know, Hank is hard to do. We could do a tank, like to, to agent and equivalent model. I don't think that would be particularly hard. Um, you know, of course, there's a whole discussion about is Tank really Hank, you know, and, you know, I, I could go into that rabbit hole, but um, I think Hank and Tank models are kind of interesting just in terms of like, you know, the propagation mechanisms that they add, which are kind of more demand side. Um, so here, I think the relative prices are playing, you know, an important role. You know, Raphael brought up, rate, you know, wage rigidities and all this. Um, you know, I can imagine when in an extension where you have, you know, some kind of Hank or Tank kind of features, you know, more propagation from the demand side taking place. And I think that would definitely be something that could be interesting to explore. All right, thank you. Um, and I, I guess the, there's one more question about the presentations being available. Uh, if the presenters are happy to do so, they could email them to Sebra, uh, office at sebra.org, and then Sebra can forward the presentations to uh, people that are interested. Um, so I think we just have a few more minutes left. Uh, are there any further questions? Seeing none, uh, I think we can conclude. Uh, I'll hand this over to Raphael to do that. Well, thank you everybody so much for these excellent presentations. Um, thank you very much for moderating. Uh, everything was super efficient. So, so um, I, I think uh, we hope to see everybody back for the next edition um, and uh, have a good day, everyone. Thank you. Bye.